homomorphisms which differ by conjugation by an element of G. Okay, and so that's the definition of the background gauge field. It's a home, home the set of home, you know, it's a homomorphism modulo this this conjugation by an element of G. Now, um, that's, I mean, that's correct, but somewhat formal. So let me try to say in practice, okay, I give you a quantum field theory with the global symmetry. How do I compute things in the present, you know, in, in with one of these background fields turned on? Okay. So the idea, so let's say that um, I want to turn on a holonomy around this loop, right? So what you're supposed to do um, so since it's a quantum field theory with a global symmetry, um, there's going to be a unitary operator U of G, which is co-dimension one, which is just the operator that implements the symmetry on the Hilbert space, right? In quantum mechanics, uh, at least for internal symmetries, they're always represented by unitary operators on the Hilbert space. Okay? And so the idea is I take the one cycle around which I want to have a holonomy, and then on the Poincaré dual cycle, or more accurately on a Poincaré dual cycle, I wrap U of G. And the reason that turns on a holonomy is because if I put an operator O here that's charged under the symmetry and I pull it around the loop, then it get, at some point it gets stuck on the symmetry operator. Right? So if I if I pull it around, you know, at some point I have to do something like this. And then if I keep going further, then what I should really do is just break off a piece of the symmetry operator. Um, and then now I can just drag this gadget around the rest of the way to here. Um, but this of course is just the symmetry. This just gives you the symmetry action on the operator, right? So then you see that as O goes around, when I get back to here, you could call this like D of G times O. So that implements the holonym. And so to, in, to turn on a general background, um, you have to turn on a network of these operators sort of wrapping one on the dual cycle for each of the loops. Okay. There's no distinguishing between space and time there, so I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, this could be either Euclidean or Lorentzian, I'm saying now. Yeah. Okay, so I just shouldn't think of the U of G is not the thing you put on time slides. Um, uh, well, you could, but it's a, it's a, you, you can either put it on a time slice or a spatial slice. So it depends. So if this holonomy is spatial, right, then U is going to have one in that one direction will be time yeah. that it's wrapped on. Yeah. Um, but if you're, for example, in Euclidean signature and this, and the cycle is the time cycle, then you will be able to be space. Like, I'll do an example in a sec where we're going to see that. Too. So there's one distinction between D. I thought that with it's, if something is moving in time, then it's a feedback to me. Yeah, yeah. So th there's a, this this terminology is terrible, and the practitioners in the field make it worse. Okay. So the correct, I think the best language to talk about this is that an operator is what von Neumann told us is an operator, which is a map, a linear map on a Hilbert space. Okay. So that's always an operator that's mapped in the space direction, that's wrapped in the space direction. Um, if you have something that's extended in time, it should be called defect because it's changing the Hilbert space, okay? And if you want to talk about them both using the same word, call them insertions, okay? I think that's the correct language. You know, some people haven't figured this out yet and use the word operator where they shouldn't, but I think von Neumann defined operator and we should stick to von Neumann. Um, well, probably he didn't define it, but yeah, I'm sure that idea goes back for that, but... He was really good at them. <laughs> um, okay, so um, so let me do an example of this just to make it a little more concrete. Um, okay, so, so that's turning on the background. Now let's sum over backgrounds. Um, so in principle, we just sum over these networks of defects, but let's do an example so it's more concrete. So let's do an example where M is a torus, is a two torus, um, and G is Z2. So, so now this is Euclidean because I made the I made the space time a, a torus. Um, so then here's what it looks like. So now to gauge, we should sum, right? So here's what the gauged partition function looks like. So more accurately, you should divide by the volume of the group in sum. Okay. So here the volume is two. Um, and then there are four terms. 
Okay, there's a term with no holonomies of any kind. That's the easy one. Okay. Um, now, let's be clear. Um, there's a term with a holonomy in the time direction. So then what I'm drawing here is U of G. Okay. So this is a term with holonomy in the time direction, but not the space direction. Um, there's a term with holonomy in the space direction, but not the time direction. Um, and then finally, there's a term um, uh, with holonomy in both. Okay. Um, now, I just um, let me just make a comment about this term because someone is probably wondering. So, you see here the defect operators are intersecting with each other. And in principle, you could worry that there's some UV issue with defining the intersection um, where you require more data here than just saying it's these two. Um, if that's true, if there are different choices here, then you say that the Z2 symmetry has an anomaly and you can't gauge it. Okay, so that's the discrete version of the idea that anomalies come from contact terms and currents in quantum field theory. So in this talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume there's not an anomaly. If there's an anomaly, then obviously you can't gauge these things. Um, okay. So this is kind of, if you like, the path integral description of gauging. Now, it's going to be useful for us to also have a Hilbert space language. So let me say that. So these two terms give um, a projection um, onto singlets um, in um, the ungauged theory. So if you have a Z2 symmetry, right, then um, the operator one plus U over two is a projection onto the states of charge one, right? Because if a state has charge one, I get one plus one over two, which is one. And if the if I have an, a state of charge minus one, then I get zero. Okay. So this is just inserting from the Hilbert space point of view, this projection onto singlets into the Hilbert space that we started with. Um, this term is a again a projection on the singlets. Um, but not in the original Hilbert space, and instead in a new Hilbert space, which is conventionally called the twisted sector. Okay, so this is the Hilbert space you get by cutting this way. So then there's some operator here where the fields jump across this operator in some way. Right, and that defines a new Hilbert space. So maybe just to mention two examples of this. Oh, you have a question? Yes. So just make sure when you say that uh, the Z2 symmetry cannot be gauged if there is an anomaly. Yeah. And yes. Uh, as, as the usual case in quantum field theory that happens, that if the this one plus one D theory, maybe a CFT with the Z2 symmetry, or maybe just the usual uh, any one plus one D quantum field theory with Z2 anomaly is possible you can aid a two plus one D bulk in vertical field theory such that you can gauge the, this one plus one D theory and two plus one D together. So so that's the case for quantum field theory. No, I think that's, sorry. I mean, yeah, so people sometimes say these things. I mean, I, I gave a talk about this at some point. The definition of an anomaly is not something that comes from a topological theory in one dimension higher. That's a... That's something that seems to be true for the anomalies that we know about, but it's I, I, I view it as an open problem whether all anomalies can be interpreted that way. The definition of an anomaly is that it's an obstruction to gauging the symmetry. And so the way to see it explicitly here, the only thing that could fail here is if there's some problem defining this so that I can't interpret the sum of these two terms as a projection onto singlets and twisted sector. And the way it can fail is if there's different ways of resolving this. Um, depending which way you look at it. So there's a nice paper by Shu Hang and yeah. um, I think Beach and Beach and Beach and yeah. yeah, which explains that. But, but my point is exactly that, is that there is a minus sign maybe regarding the last term or something, right? Yeah. So that's a, basically capture this anomaly by a three cycle in terms of this, this term. And, yeah. And in, in, in the usual quantum field theory or condensed matter system, you can resolve that by adding the two plus one D 
Yeah, yeah, in this example, you can, you can, but I don't think that should be. That's no. not. I don't think. I. I really yeah. don't think that should be the definition of an anomaly. Okay, that's true. I'm just for that for this example, but that doesn't mean it's true in all examples, and there's no proof that it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, my point is that maybe you are consider quantum gravity so that uh, even if, if the system let me have any notion of CRT anomaly or total anomaly with that symmetry, then. Maybe the whole that's not a whole system at all. You should also consider some additional systems, such the whole CRT does not have a anomaly. That's why you can gauge. I guess. Uh, I, I mean, you, you can try. I, I think it's better to just say you shouldn't gauge it. If, if you add something it. else to the theory, it's a different theory, and now we can study that theory. But that's not the theory I'm interested in. Yeah. Um. Sorry. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I was going to mention two examples of this. this is oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Is this? This is after a subset of the original no. Hilbert space. No, it's a new Hilbert space. So yeah, so 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 for example, if if so we could do a free scalar and the symmetry could be phi goes to minus phi symmetry. That was the first example I was going to talk about. So that's the Z2 orbifold from string theory. So people from string theory know it very well. Okay. And then in the untwisted sector, phi is periodic as you go around the circle. And in the twisted sector, it's anti-periodic as you go around. So there aren't anti-periodic states in this Hilbert space. It's really a new Hilbert space. Yeah. Yeah, so so, so uh, I need the I need I need both of the four by configuration for I need the analogous here if I want to gauge this. Yeah, nothing I'm saying involves conformal symmetry here. So, but I can understand these last two configurations if the theory is here, because I have monster theory if you are referring to these fours. Sorry, I don't understand. You have what? You, you have modular invariant on fours, for example. I don't know what that means. Huh? Oh, modular invariant. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I see. Sorry. But you're, yes. Yeah. yeah, so and for, for that, I think I understand why I have to include these last two configurations. But I think for a non CFP, for example, two non CFP. So how no, OK, OK. The, are you, you guys keep bringing up all these uh, pet peeves of mine. OK, so mm -hmm. modular invariance is not a principle of quantum field theory. The principle of quantum field theory is locality. Modular invariance is a consequence of locality. Okay. It's not the only consequence, you know. So in CFT language, it turns out that you can take locality, which is a very general principle, and turn it into you sort of replace it by crossing symmetry and modular invariance in one plus one CFT. But that's just some um, accident of one plus one CFT. It's not CFT, it's not true in higher dimensions or even in non-conformal theories in one plus one dimensions. So here I'm not trying to use conformal symmetry, right? It's just the, I'm trying to say what the general rule is for gauging. So I think this interpretation is always correct. And, and you always have to include all these terms because you, you want to have the definition of, of gauging be that you sum over background gauge fields. And so if you forget to include some of the background gauge fields, then it's a violation of locality, right? You're not summing over all the possible backgrounds. You're putting some weird constraint on the fields that you're summing over. You know, it would be like saying, I'm only going to sum over, like if I tried to do the scalar path integral over, over a free scalar, but I said, no, I'm only going to sum over fields where if I integrate phi along a spatial slice, I get 10. Well, why would you do that, right? Like that's a very non-local thing to do. It's going to destroy the axioms of quantum field theory. Well, I mean, I'm so sorry, maybe, uh, maybe this is my question. So my understanding of the first two terms is that so I'm constraining my Hilbert space. Yeah. To only contain the states which are inferior and Yeah. Space. So I think in this sense I can understand that I'm gauging this. That's really the part why I should include additional sector. No, because a gate a gauge symmetry is supposed to be a redundancy of description, right? Right. So if I go around a circle and come back to where I started. If this Z2 is a redundancy of description, then I had better allow configurations where, where that redundancy happened, sure. right? I think you can just think about it like that. It's like when you're defining a, a, you know, a connection on a bundle or something, right? Like you, you want the rules for computing the partition function to be local. You know, so it's a redundancy. It's a local redundancy. There can't be some weird global restriction on it. Yeah, so somehow a failure of modularity is really a failure of locality, like that. Yeah. Okay, um, 
So actually, that, that oh, yeah, I was just going to mention maybe in passing. So so I, I said one of the examples already that's the C2 overfold. Another example is in the Ising model. So if you do the 2D Ising model. Um, so what I was told in kindergarten is that um, at the critical point, the 2D Ising model is equal to a free Majorana fermion. Okay, this is not correct. Okay, if you if you learn one thing from this talk that you did, probably you know this, but if you didn't know this, learn it now. Okay, it is not correct that a free Majorana fermion is the critical Ising model. To get to the because the critical Ising model is bosonic, there are no fermions, right? There are no operators with non-zero fermion number. So the Ising, the critical point of the Ising model is a free Majorana fermion with um, fermion parity treated as a gauge symmetry. Okay. So any operator which is a fermion, like from Jordan Wigner, whatever, has a line attached to it, as you know from Jordan Wigner, and that line is the Wilson line of the fermion of fermion parity. So, so the Ising model is another example of this. Um, okay, so that's all I was going to say for the internal case. Now let's get on to time reversal. Subir can hear ten minutes later. Um, unfortunately, it means you hear the formalism part of the talk and not the fun results that come from the formalism. So, um, so let's try to now apply what we learned to time reversal. Okay, I, I, I could also discuss uh, spatial reflection R. There's an interesting story, which is that the twisted states of gauging spatial reflection or open strings, okay, which is a somewhat controversial topic in the history of the subject, but it's true. Okay, so for, in Joe's book, for example, he says it's not true, but nonetheless, it's true. So if you want to hear about that, ask me later. I guess most of you aren't string theorists, so you don't care about the unoriented string. Um, so let's go on to time reversal. So um, so we're, at, we're exactly going to study this a free scalar on this Lorenzian Mobius strip. Okay, so the, the boundary condition, so I'll take, I'll take this to have length L. So there's a boundary condition which says that if I go this in L in space, um, then I get back to where I started, but with the, the direction of time reverse. Okay, and so now in this language that we introduced, the idea is that this um, theory is the twisted sector of gauging time reversal. Okay, and then eventually we're going to want to project on singlets, right? Because we're really supposed to. So this picture I'm drawing, it's like sort of this. It's quantum field theory in this background. Okay. And then we're eventually going to want to sum over these two and project onto singlets. But the you know the tricky thing I think is just defining the twisted sector in the first place, and so that's what this theory is going to be. And so I want to emphasize. So I said that in order to actually gauge time reversal, we probably want to be doing quantum gravity. Okay, I think that's true. But to turn on a background field for time reversal, we can just do that in quantum field theory. Okay, and so that's what I'm going to be doing here. Okay. Um, so um, the first thing I want to say about this is that if you look um, at t equals zero, um, this theory has a fairly reasonable set of initial data. Okay, so if we just think about it classically, right? What did the what did these equation equations tell us classically about the initial data here? Right. It says that phi, um, so f t equals zero. Um, phi has to be periodic, right? So if, if I put t equals zero here, it just says phi is periodic. Um, but then if I take the time derivative, um, then I get something anti-periodic. Okay, so if you like, that's kind of the definition of the twisted sector, is I take you know wave functionals of phi here, but with the rule that phi is periodic and phi dot is anti. Now, this is a fairly robust set of initial data, right? You can vary things independently in different places. Um, and uh, maybe I won't inflict it on you, but you can write down a complete set of solutions of the wave equation um, for arbitrary initial data here. So you just have to figure out what the modes are that obey these boundary conditions. So at the level of solving the classical equations in motion, it seems there's at least a candidate Nice phase space, which is just the set of all solutions to the wave location um, of any of these initial conditions. 
And you can check that indeed the solutions obey this everywhere and not just at t equals zero. Um, so, um, so that's good. Um, on the other hand, um, you have to deal with this issue with the canonical commutation relation, which I wrote, which I wrote, which I erased. So I'm gonna write it again. Okay, you have to say what do you do about the time derivative here. Now, actually, I want to emphasize something over here before I go back to that. So, I gave you a definition of what I mean by a background gauge field. But if you look at what I did here, right, um, the correlators in this background actually depend on more than just W because they depend on the location of this brain. Because if I move, you know, this location is the place where O picks up the transformation. And now you can try, so essentially, if you like, there's some sort of branch cut in the correlation functions. And to really define them as functions, you have to say where the branch cut is, okay? You can try to define them as sections of something, right? And then you don't have to talk about that, but if you really want to define them as functions on the space where you started, then you're going to have to tolerate a discontinuity here. And so my claim is that the same thing is true here. We have to pick um, in the sense of the, if we want to define things as functions, we have to pick a location of the, of the time reversal operator, which is extended in time. Um, and that will be a point across which our definition of the time group here changes. Okay. So in other words, so the easiest thing to do is to pick it to be here, okay? And then I just say, time is going this way here, and I just tolerate that things are going to be discontinuous as I go across. Now, S in this case, once you actually gauge the symmetry, this extra information goes away. Because in order to find the location of this thing, you need to move a charged operator across it. And once you gauge the symmetry, you get rid of all the charged operators, OK? so. This partition function, I can really view as just a sum over these Ws, because even if I wanted to sum over the location of the brains, it wouldn't do anything. Okay. Um, and so I claim the same is true here. And that's why this is, you know, the fact that there's a discontinuity here is not so bad. The only thing you really need is that the discontinuity matches on the two sides. Now you might say, well, this doesn't look very discontinuous, but you have to remember that there's an I here. And that time reversal is an anti-linear operator. And so when you move across it, I does change sign. Okay, so both sides of this change sign as you move across. And so it's consistent to just pick a direction of time here and expose it here, and then just accept that there's going to be a discontinuity at the edge. All right. Yeah. The discontinuity is that you go around the spatial. Right. Sorry, what? The discontinuity is yes. in the spatial slice. Or yes. Or? Yeah, and the same and the same was true here. Right. So if we think of this as space and this is time, because we're in the twisted sector. Yeah. yeah. So uh think by all. So I mean so from the game theory perspective, I was yeah. uh, it's not it's it's not an all way version. Yeah, that's right. So that's why it's okay, right? So that, that's so that's why you can't detect the discontinuity so once you go to the gauge theory. theory starting from this canonical. Sorry, what? You, you define your quantum theory. Quantum yeah, theory. but right now what I'm defining, I'm defining the quantum field theory in the presence of a background field. I haven't yet gauged the symmetry. So oh, in the oh, twisted oh, sector, oh, phi dot is a phi operator. Oh, okay. It gets killed when I do the projection here, but I haven't yet done the projection. So after the gauging, the so-called energy. No, but after the gauging, then it's fine, right? Because, because the discontinuity is gone. Because you only get to talk about t invariant things. So if I, for example, if I put phi squared here, I would get, I wouldn't have any problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the same as for the internal case. I mean, everything that happened in the internal case happens here, but it's not worse. I don't think. Yeah, I think so. So I think in the literature, people were confused because they wanted to define this. For example, that this choice breaks the symmetry of rotations as you go around here which is a symmetry of this purely as a geometry. And so you can complain about that. And they did complain about it. That, that was why they said this shouldn't be allowed is because they wanted to quantize in a way that preserved the rotational symmetry. Okay. 
But I think it was just a mistake. If you think of it as a background for T symmetry, then you shouldn't have that symmetry until you gauge. And when you gauge, you do. And that's that's good enough for me. Um, okay. Um, so that was that that was subtlety number one in the old literature, which I think is fine. There's a second subtlety. Um, which is that there are no natural states. Okay. So um, so let me try to say that. So in quantum field theory, right? You know, I mean, so to be clear, there is a, this has a Hilbert space with positive norm. So it's not that there aren't any any states. The problem is that there's no particularly nice states, and it's similar to doing quantum field theory in a time dependent background, right? So if I just, you know, I do I do quantum field theory in Minkowski space, but then I put some bumps in the metric here and there to break time translation symmetry, then there's no there's no ground state, right? So there, so you, that's our favorite special state. Now what we do in the context say of De Sitter is that we use the Euclidean path integral to prepare a state. So you can do that even if there's not time translation symmetry, and also for the black hole, right? We can talk about the hartle hawking state. Um, here it's even worse. So, so let's try to use the Euclidean path integral to define a state and see what we get. Right. So, so if I want to do that, so so say I want to define um, some state that I'll call rho hat. Um, so the natural thing to do is to take the Euclidean Mobius strip. Um, And then kind of put a phi initial boundary condition here, a phi final boundary condition there, and do the path in the world. Um, so if you're, so how shall I say? So now you might, so I, you see, I put a density operator here, not a pure state, right? The reason I had to do that is because these boundary conditions could act the bra and the cat. So at best, I'm going to get a mixed state. I'm certainly not going to get a pure quantum state. I'm trying to use the Euclidean Mobius strip. Um, but um, that, so, so I can certainly define an operator row hat this way, right? This defines an operator, but in order for this to be a state, row hat has to be a positive operator. And if you just look at this, why should it be positive? But there's no reason for this path in a to be positive. Um, and in fact, it isn't. Okay, so, so row hat is not positive. Um, or yeah, or even Hermitian. Um, so, um, so this is a thing you can define, but it's not a state. Um, so then you have kind of a problem. I mean, it's not it's not a serious problem because the theory is fine. There's a Hilbert space. There are self adjoint operators on the Hilbert space. You can compute expectation values of the operators in the states. But what are you going to compute, right? You know, which state do you pick? Which operator do you pick, right? It's not clear that there's anything interesting to compute. In this theory, yeah. What? What is the Hilbert space? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's yeah. I think the way you can think about it is you take functionals phi of x that are periodic. I'm sorry, functions of phi of x that are periodic, but then you restrict to wave functions where where um, where minus i d d phi is anti-periodic. Um, because you want to, you want to remove the state of this. Um, so I, I can just formally define a Hilbert space like that. Now, strictly speaking, I should have two normalizable states and so on. Sorry, now I have two questions. The arrows in that picture of a path in the row, you're not gluing the top right to the bottom left, right? Just the way you. No, I am. Yeah, th this is I So there's a boundary condition that this is identified with that. And similarly, this is identified with that, right? So that's why it's not a pure state. If, 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 if these things weren't connected, it would just be the outer product of the pure state with itself, right? And but then if you like, the, the pure state comes with a label, which is the boundary conditions here and here, and then I have to sum over those labels, so that makes it a mixed state. And why are you making that uh, identification? Because I, I, want, I want to get something that, that acts on this Hilbert space. So it has to respect the this anti-periodic nature of phi. Um, so, um, so actually, I'm going to give this a name. 
I'm going to call it um, the Mobius, I should write like that, pseudo sleep. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, I think I agree with that. Uh, with this specific basis, uh, Rho can be used as a matrix. Um, but like, it's not clear to me like uh, whether Rho is a, an operator or not, in the sense that if you have a, a symmetrical operating on this um, space, like does Rho really transform under unitary replication of this? Well, no, I just define, to define an operator, I just have to define it in a basis, right? So I'm just defining it in a basis here. Um, That's it. I, I'm going to give you in, a, in 2D CFT, I can give you a formula for row hat, which I'm going to give you in a sec, which I think will make it more intuitive. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, I mean, to define an operator, I just have to tell you how it acts in the basis. What you say? Well, we, in principle, we can worry about the domain of the operator and so on. And probably we should if we're being careful. Sure. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's possible. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I want to make this more intuitive. And I, I promise things are going to get very concrete in a minute. We're almost done with the formal part of the talk, but I, I, we have to go through this to just get all the language in place. Um, so um, to I can compute this row hat. Um, explicitly in 2D CFT. So the idea is I take this picture. Um, okay. And then I take the top half and I just kind of plop it over like this. Okay. So I'm going to rewrite the top half down here. But since I plopped it over, something nice happens. And then here I get time reversal acting on um, phi initial. Okay. Because I, I plopped it over. Um, but you see, now this is something very civilized, right? You see, now these identifications are going the same way. These identifications are going the same way. So this thing is preparing the ground state of the theory on a cylinder that's twice as big with the usual boundary conditions, cylinder boundary conditions, okay? So this thing is equal to the wave function um, of the theory on the cylinder of radius 2L, um, but with this funny time reversal thrown in, thrown in here. Okay. So that's true in general, actually. Um, I didn't yet use conformal symmetry. Um, the place where I can use conformal symmetry is that in conformal field theory, I know the wave functional on a cylinder because I can map it to, to the half, to the in, infinite space, and then I can use the Riddler decomposition. So I won't sorry, go through the details of that. Um, but what this tells you is that in 2D CFT, this row hat has a nice formula. It's e to the minus pi k um, L, where this k is the modular Hamiltonian of half the cylinder that's twice as big. Okay. And then times um, a product of two anti-unitary operators. So CRT, which as we've discussed is always a symmetry, and then theta T for time reversal. So of course we're assuming time reversal is a symmetry here, or we wouldn't even be having this discussion. Okay. Um, so uh, we have put this here. Okay. And so what you can see is that the Mobius pseudo state is a positive operator times a unitary, because the product of two anti-unitaries is unitary. Okay. And so in particular, it's not positive, right? It's not permission, right? But it's, it's uh, a positive operator times a unitary. Now, I think I won't go through it because the details are somewhat boring. But if, if you want something to compute in this theory, the nicest thing we could think of is to just compute correlation functions in the Mobius pseudo state. So I would call these computables and not observables because it's not a state. But there's something nice to compute, and you can use them to characterize, you know, the causal structure of the theory. You can check that the correlators are consistent with the choice we made for the canonical commutation relations. And I think I won't drag you through that. I'll just say that once you have this, there's a set of things you can do. Right. All right. So far, this has been somewhat dry and technical. So now I want to actually have fun. Okay. 
Okay, I'll tell you some things about quantum gravity that we learned from this. But uh, I'll be happy if there are more questions, concerns, complaints. Yes. Is there a relation between the two states and the state temperature? Um, uh, not. I wouldn't. I mean, not obviously, right? Um, you know, you can check if you if you chase through these things here, you can sort of check that this thing has the right boundary conditions to be consistent with the anti-commutativity. So the anti-periodicity of phi dot. Um, you no, know, but I think yeah, the thing is just you just have to accept that there's no natural state. You know, it's like quantum quantum mechanics with the time dependent Hamilton. You know, just what are you what are you going to do? You know, somehow you have to have a physics problem in mind to decide. You know what states are interesting. So, but just to characterize the compute the theory, I can compute things like trace of rho hat, you know, o of x, o of y. Uh, and they aren't physical correlators, but they're computables that you can use to study the theory. Um, and so we did a fair bit of that in the paper. And and I'll actually in a I'm going to do ADS CFT in a second, and I'll mention that one of these does end up being interesting. Okay. Maybe I should just say as a historical comment. Um, so there's a long history in Euclidean signature of turning on backgrounds for R, right? That's the business of taking a Euclidean field theory and studying it on a manifold that's not orientable. The, so that goes back to the 80s. The, the new thing here is to go to Lorentzian signature, and then you have to deal with the fact that R and T are different. Uh, and so you get different things depending which one you gauge. And that was somehow hidden by just working in Euclidean signature, which is what people always did in the past. So you say hidden, but it's already contained. Like when you do it, some of the topologies and different factors. Yeah, but it's, compl it's complicated because in Euclidean signature, CRT is always gauged. In, because it's in the identity component. And so if you're doing gravity, then it's going to be gauged. Um, so um, so then it's hard. There's not really a difference between gauging R and gauging T, but really CT. You know, you kind of, either you gauge both or you gauge neither. And that's this choice of including unoriented geometries or not. In Lorentzian signature, you have this additional choice, at least from the low energy point of view, which is to not gauge CRT. That's not a choice you had in Euclidean signature, but it's a choice you have in Lorentzian signature. Um, now, I'm actually saying it's wrong, right? I'm saying CRT has to be gauged, but you can't see it just by looking in your at low energy path intervals. But I'm just trying to mention that you're just trying to make sense of this sum of topologies that includes unoriented manifolds in Lorentzian signature. The um, Euclidean pathway is not missing this gauge. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, right, right. But I mean, the thing is, so Euclidean gravity is very confusing, right? Because it's not it, it's not equal, you know, in, in quantum field theory, you know, the relation between Euclidean and Lorentzian is simple. You know, you just, you add, there's an analytic continuation and you can interpret things in the Hamlet space formalism. But the usual calculations of quantum gravity in Euclidean signature don't have Lorentzian interpretations within the, the Lorentzian theory. Um, they're sort of inequivalent starting points for trying to quantize the theory. Um, so there's a lot of fight in the literature about you include the, this geometry, you don't include them. Uh, so for example, in one plus one, right, with JT, right, if you do the Euclidean quantization, you don't get quantum mechanics at all. Um, you get like this average over quantum systems, right, which is not quantum mechanics. Yeah. And if you start from Euclidean point of view, if you start from the Lorentzian point of view and do canonical quantization, you're of course going to get quantum mechanics. So they're just different. Um, yeah. If you use manifolds, Brent's manifolds yes. that are not time oriented locus, well, there's a bubble cover. Yes. And are you looking in the flipping the sheets as complex conjugation? Um, yeah, that has to do with whether you gauge T or CT. So that's a choice you could make. Yeah, and in fact, strictly speaking, so I, I buried this distinction by doing a real scalar field here because I didn't want to have the discussion. But if you do a complex scalar, then um, if you gauge T in Lorentzian signature, then in Euclidean signature, when you go around, it should really be CT and vice versa. So if in if in Euclidean signature, you say it's a time reversal as you go around, then when you go back to Lorentzian signature, it's CT that you gauge. So it's a choice, you could do either. If you have both symmetries, you can do either. Um, 
Sorry, say it again. Shall I worry that KL, the KL operator, you know, uh, is not the relevant operator? I'm um, good. So, yeah, you can worry about it to the extent that you ever worry about this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not a mathematician, so it's okay with for me. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's the usual. I, I think the right way to say it is it's, it will have some very restricted domain, but if, as long as you only use it to compute the things you're supposed to compute, then it's fine. Yeah. Um, and certainly, if you have a regulator, then it's totally fine. Right. Yeah. So the original Hilbert space becomes a subregion Hilbert space after it became the It becomes what? A subregion Hilbert space after it um, Yeah, yeah, that's right. But that, that's just, I'm just computing this function now. I'm, I'm not actually computing anything in the Hilbert space because remember, this operator just acts here. Right. right? So I'm never actually computing anything on this whole Hilbert space. I just I'm just using it to get a formula for this. So, but I can do everything just in terms of this without needing the, the bigger Hilbert space. Um, just make sure one thing: you say rule phase not positive, but earlier, very earlier. Yeah. What do you mean? You mean the eigenvalue is not positive? positive. So well, okay, so. It, 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 yeah, so in, in finite, so you have to be careful about that because it's not permission, right? Okay. So yeah, so so I mean, a positive a positive operator will be Hermitian, I guess. So then yeah, you. I mean, one definition of positive, I guess, is it's Hermitian operator whose eigenvalues are positive. Um, I think in infinite dimensions we have to be a little more careful. I think what what I would what I would mean is that for any state psi. And actually, for for a state, I should probably put. I don't know, no, I should put that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that to me, that's the definition of a positive operator is that for any state, this is true. And so that should be true for a state, but it's not true here. Certainly, it's this unitary here. Um, okay. Um, all right, now let's try to have some fun. I, get this, I feel like this is too, too much formalism. Um, so let, let's do ADS. And so, and actually, I'm going to do ADS three CFD two. So, um, let me first remind you of some standard thing in ADS three, which is the BTZ black hole. Okay. So the BTZ black hole is the ADS three version of the Schwarzschild geometry. So in Lorentzian signature, it has a Penrose diagram like this, where there are um, some singularity here, which is really in BTC phase a conical singularity. Um, and then there are two asymptotic ADS boundaries. Um, I will think about this in cross school coordinates, capital T and capital X, which cover the whole geometry, or T goes up. Um, and usually what we do is we um, we cut this at capital T equals zero, and we study it in the harlow hawking state. That's the thing we like to do uh, with this geometry. There's also the Euclidean version. Okay. Um, so here, by the way, it's this times a circle. There's a circle sitting on top of this that's driven the fiber. It's sitting over this because it's a three dimensional geometry. Um, similarly, here in Euclidean signature, it's a disk with a circle sitting on top of it. And the idea is that you um, have periodicity beta as you go around, and you interpret this as computing. The thermal partition function of the dual CFT2 on a, uh, quantized on a circle. Um, and in particular, when you do this calculation, you compute <coughs> the partition function, C of beta, um, which in the semi classical approximation is pi squared over 2g beta. Um, or if you want to write it in CFT language, it's pi squared C over 3 beta where C is the central charge. <clears throat> um, so this is like, you know, anyone who studies ADS3 gravity, this is kind of the first calculation that you do to figure out what's going on. Um, <clears throat> so, so far that's standard. Now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna do something bad. So I'm gonna introduce a geometry that I call the CRT twisted black hole.
So the idea is that there's a, I'll start in Lorentzian signature. So, so there's a natural involution of this geometry, like a Z2 um, isometry. So, um, and I can quotient by that. So let me say what the quotient that I do is. So I take T, X, and phi, where phi is the angle around the circle that's living on top of everything. Um, and I identify this with minus T, and minus x, so that's a CRT transformation, hence CRT twisted. Um, and then, but okay, this would have fixed points if I don't do anything to phi. So then I'm gonna shift phi by pi. Okay, it has to be pi because I want a z2. Okay. So if I do this transformation twice, I get back to where I started, right? Because this is a shift by two pi. Okay. Um, so, um, and this, Identification has no fixed points. So this is a smooth Lorentzian geometry. Let me try to draw what it looks like, right? So this reflection of X exchanges the two axioms. So I can try to make a representation of this. Special surface here. And then there's one ADS boundary here, which is just the, the usual Lorentzian cylinder. Um, there's a horizon like this, but then there's this funny thing where, you know, if I fall in like that, then I come out down here going backwards in time and on the other side of the circle that I didn't draw. Okay. Um, you can also draw it, I can give a more accurate representation by saying that, um, so this now includes the circle. Um, the geometry consists of the region in between these two cylinders, where the outer cylinder is the ADS boundary, right, the Lorentzian cylinder. But then at the inner cylinder, I do some sort of antipodal identification, uh, both in space and time. So this, again, is, an, is not a time-oriental geometry. In fact, if you look at the, at the, the, ge the metric you know, in the topology just of this surface, it's our Lorentzian Mobius strip again. Okay, if you take the Laurentian cylinder, that's this double cover Dan was mentioning. It's this, right? Then I do this identification and that gives me the Lorentzian Mobius strip. Um, so this is not time orientable. Um, on the other hand, from the boundary point of view, it's like totally kosher, right? This is just, uh, it obeys the same boundary conditions that we think uh, you should obey for the conventional CFT on the cylinder. So if, if the role of ADS-CFT is some overall bulk geometries that are consistent with the boundary conditions, then at least if CRT is a gauge symmetry, then you had better be including this one too, okay? <clears throat> now, um, you might say, well, um, that's silly, Daniel, um, but what I'm now gonna explain to you is that there's a calculation I can do in the dual CFT where this is the dominant configuration. Uh, and so to match the CFT, I have to include this. Okay, and so in some sense, this is a proof that in quantum gravity, we're gonna have to learn to live with these things. Okay. So to do the, I, I first have to motivate the calculation. So by thinking about the, what kind of state I might like for fields in this geometry, okay. Now S, here, right, I'm going to run into this issue of no natural state. Um, so I can try to define, I can try to define a Euclidean pseudo state. That would come from doing the same identification, but now to the Euclidean version of the black hole. So I can define again a pseudo state by final, well, <laughs> by initial, um, by taking the we draw a little bigger um, the Euclidean geometry with this identification. So then there's some like this is somehow identified with that, but with including the rotation by pi. And then I put phi initial here and phi final there. Okay, so that defines a pseudo state from the bulk point of view. Here it's actually easy to see what it is from the boundary point of view as well. So from the boundary point of view, what is this, right? The idea is I start here at the initial state. So remember it was beta to go all the way around. Right? So here I go, I go a quarter of the way around. 
Okay, so I get um, um, e to the minus beta over four h. Okay, then this is identified with that, but with a rotation by pi in along the spatial circle. So um, I should put e to the i pi j here, and then I should keep going here, and then I just do another rotation, another evolution by e to the minus beta h over four to get back up to here, and then now that's the final state. Okay, so this is the CFT formula for the pseudo state. And of course, since J and H are commuting, I can rewrite this as e to the minus beta over two H times e to the I pi J, okay? And so look here, we have again, a positive operator times a unitary. All right, so it's the same kind of thing that we had over here. But from the CFT point of view, okay, fine, this is the thing. Um, now what I wanna do is I want to compute uh, the easiest thing to compute is just the sort of, you know, I don't want to call it the norm, but the trace of the pseudo state. Okay. So from the CFT point of view, that's trace of e to the minus theta over two h times e to the i pi j. Okay. We can also insert correlators into this, and I'll discuss that in a sec, but let's just first compute this. Okay. Um, so the bulk calculation is easy, okay? Because I'm just supposed to compute the Euclidean action of this, which is just half the action of that, because I just did a Z2 quotient. So I should take this result and I should just divide by two in the exponent, in the, in, in the taking order. Um, so then I get e to the pi squared of C over six beta. Okay, great. Now the CFT calculation. All right. So if you stare at this, right, this is computing the CFT partition function on a torus which is tilted by pi. Okay. So, um, yeah, roughly speaking, something like this, right, where this distance is pi, this distance is beta over two. Okay. Um, so if you say that in terms of the complex structure parameter, of the torus, um, <laughs> there's a one half, which is real, plus, um, I always forget the normalizations of this, yeah, good. Um, and then there's an imaginary part, which is beta over four pi. Okay, see you. So I'm just trying to compute the CFT partition function on this torus. Um, let's, let's take this quantity and define it to be epsilon, because I'm interested in the limit where beta is, um, uh, small because I want to do high temperature. That's where this should be like a black hole. If beta is large, I'm at low temperature, and this geometry probably won't be the dominant thing. It'll be some. I'll be computing something near the vacuum. Okay. Now, um, this CFT partition function is something that I can compute in any CFT by using cardiology. Okay. So let's see how it works. So I want to compute. Z of one half plus I epsilon, right? So I can first do an S transformation to turn this into minus one over one half plus I epsilon. Um, then I can Taylor expand since epsilon is small to write this as Z of minus two plus um, four times I epsilon. Um, then, um, I can do a T transformation to get rid of the two minus twos. Okay. And then now finally I can do S again. So this is a minus one over four I epsilon, or just Z of I over four epsilon. Okay. Um, but this is just now a low temperature partition function. Right, I am just uh, now, now, you know, I mean, that's like back here with just beta here, right? Um, and so it's controlled by the Casimir energy of the ground state, right? Because the low temperature partition function should just be e to the minus beta times the Casimir energy, okay? And of course that's known in any CFT, you can compute it using the conformal transformation from the plane to the cylinder. Um, uh, so that's the, that's the cardiology. And so then indeed, this is just pi squared C over six beta. Okay, so that works. Um, 
So this, this funny saddle point that we constructed is the dominant saddle point contributing to this calculation. Yeah. Sorry, every management defense feature um, is smooth things can be standard for an economical uh, um, Well, you see, there's the E to the I pi J here, right? Yes. That's the difference. Oh, I mean, uh, grand um, oh, oh, you mean you mean for angular momentum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. So let's comment on that, right? So indeed, so, so whenever I show this to people, the first question is always, shouldn't the saddle point for this be the rotating VTZ? with an imaginary chemical potential, right? Because this is an imaginary chemical potential for angular momentum. And so that is a saddle point that contributes, but it's subleading to this one. Oh, so the curve solution is like- It's subleading, sub yeah. See. Yeah, this is the dominant saddle. Now, I just want to mention in words, um, you could complain. <laughs> I mean, come on, Daniel. This is a Euclidean calculation. And this whole issue of whether there's things are time orientable or not is a Lorenzian issue. In the end here, I just ended up with a torus, which is, it seems like a fine, you know, solid torus. It's orientable geometry, okay? So to really argue in Lorenzian signature that this geometry is here, I have to do something slightly more, which is in this pseudo state compute correlation functions and continue them to Lorenzian signature, okay? And then see if I can really match the Lorenzian correlators in the pseudo state of this Lorentzian geometry that's not time oriented. So I'll just say that works. Okay. Um, it's a little tricky because, you know, I can't actually do the CFT correlator calculation, right? Because I'm not good at strongly coupled CFT even in 2D. Um, I think if I, were, if I were better at the Taurus Virasoro identity block, I could probably do the calculation. But we were lazy. We just did the calculation in the Ising model with the excuse being that um, in this regime, the correlator should be universal. Um, but then anyway, we see it matches the bulk calculation here. I'm actually confused when you this question. So, I mean, from the boundary point of view, this is special, you just chose a particular tau. So I thought that people have computed such things using the, the Euclidean BTZ that we're rotating. You, no, but it, you, you, that calculation is usually done where this is real. So because as, as I discussed, um, sorry, where this is pure imaginary. If you want to get the rotating black hole, you, what you want is you want a real coefficient here because you want to bias the ensemble towards states with non-zero angular momentum, right? This doesn't do that. It's just a phase. I see. Yeah, so people are very good at the case where you put something real here. I see. So that, that was the case, case you would say that those would be Yes. The eyes were changes. Yeah, the eyes were changes. <laughs> and actually it matters that it's pi here. If you put two pi, then it's then then it's BTZ again. And what is the CFT interpretation of pi pi interpretation? Like? Well, it's I mean it's this, right? This is a well-defined thing in the CFT. Okay. Yes. Is this a particular I mean, is this a particular tile? Yeah. So it's Something special about it. It's just yeah, yeah. In the CFT, it's a totally kosher thing. Okay. The surprising thing is that in the bulk, it's dual something crazy. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned that the frequency should be local to be for a subleading order. Should it not contribute because it has like the frequency to be for a real angle? Has what? Real angle. No, no. You analytically continue the angle momentum. Oh, you you go that. You analytically continue to imaginary complex potential. Imaginary chemical potential, yeah. Um, okay, I don't, I don't want to go too much longer. I feel like we've already gone for a while. So I, I just want to make one other comment and then I'll stop. So here we discuss quantum gravity and ADS. I want to discuss quantum gravity in a closed universe and see what this has to say, okay? Now, let me begin by making some general comments about gauge theory in a closed universe. So for example, electrodynamics, right? So if you do electrodynamics in a, say a spatial sphere like S3 or something, right? Then the total charge of the universe is zero, which is a consequence of integrating Gauss's law over the sphere, okay? Um, as we discussed earlier, when you gauge a discrete symmetry, the same is true, right? You're supposed to project on the singlet states um, in both the twisted and the untwisted sector. Uh, and the same is true um, 
for gauging anti-unitary symmetries like time reversal or CRT. Um, so um, in the case of an anti-unitary <laughs> symmetry, however, this has a rather surprising consequence. And so that's what I think I'll leave you with. Um, so say that um, psi and phi are um, invariants under some anti-unitary symmetry, <laughs> theta. So then um, let's consider what happens if we have a superposition of psi and phi. So let's look at theta acting on a psi plus b phi. Well, um, since this is anti-linear, we get a star times psi plus b star times phi. Um, and in general, this is not equal to the state that we acted on. Okay. So what this tells us is that theta invariant states um, form um, a real vector space. Um, we're only allowed to take superpositions with real coefficients. Now, in my understanding of quantum mechanics, or certainly my understanding as of a year ago, the Hilbert space is complex. Okay, many of the standard predictions of quantum mechanics, you know, the double slit experiment, you know, the functionality of Shor's algorithm. At least in the way that I learned them, they certainly rely on phases in the amplitudes. Um, but here I'm saying that for quantum gravity in a closed universe, there are no phases. Only real superpositions are allowed. So in some sense, this is a modification of quantum mechanics. Now, you may be looking at me saying, come on, Daniel, that's ridiculous. After all, we could be living in a closed universe and we tested the quantum mechanics many times. And okay, we probably haven't run Shor's algorithm yet, but we've certainly done the double slit experiment in the course. Okay, so what's going on? Am I saying something wrong here? Um, and my claim is no. So in fact, in some sense, there is a way that I can take all the experiments that we've done with quantum mechanics and fit them into a real Hilbert space. So let me first tell you how to do that. This will be the last thing I say, and then make some comments about what it means. Um, so the basic idea is that anytime you're doing quantum cosmology, meaning quantum gravity in a closed universe, to define observables, you need some kind of clock to tell you what time it is, what the time is where you're doing the observables. Now, and the same is true for time in situations that involve time reversal, but the clock can be a bit simpler. It just needs to be a two-state clock that tells you whether time is going forward or backwards. Um, so let me say what that means in practice. So say I have some system S in a closed universe, <coughs> and I want to prepare it in a state psi S, okay? um, where that state may involve complex coefficients in the superposition. You know, because the, you know it could be an atom or something, right? Something that we've done experiments on where we were certainly able to do complex coefficients. Now, there's a way I can make a state which is theta invariant. Let's say CRT invariant. The idea is I take the tensor product of this with the state of the clock that's going forward in time, and then I prepare a superposition um, with a state where the clock is going backward in time, and then. Um, I act with the symmetry just on the system to reverse it, all right? And so now this is a CRT invariant state because CRT flips the direction of the clock and it exchanges these two states. Um, similarly, um, say I want to do a measurement to see whether or not the system is in a state chi, all right? Well, that's not T invariant, but I can, or CRT invariant, but I can make something that is by saying I do an experiment where I check if the clock is going forward in time, and if so, then I check if the system is in the state chi. Um, but then I also have to check if the clock 
is going backward in time? And if so, um, then I check if the system is in the, the CRT <laughs> conjugative kind. All right, and this is again a CRT invariant projection. So this is a state in a real vector space. This is an operator on a real vector space. But if you compute, and so I won't do the algebra, but it's easy, you can check for yourself, the expectation value of this, I just get what the Born rule would have told me to do, which is I take the overlap of the two states in the complex Hilbert space of the system X, and then I take the absolute value squared. So I can reproduce that calculation in a real vector space. Okay. Now you may be saying, well, come on, Daniel. That's I mean, what what I this is kind of bookkeeping, right? What I just showed you is that I can take any quantum system with a complex Hilbert space. I can add one degree of freedom, which I call the clock, and then I can lift all the calculations in that system to real calculations in the larger Hilbert space, including the clock. All right. So, so from that point of view, it's bookkeeping. That's something that you can always do. All right. But I want to, the key point um, is that this set of manipulations re required me to be able to define the symmetry acting on the system alone. And if the universe is really finite size, then there won't be a symmetry that just reverses the system and not the clock because there will be interactions between the system and the clock and it won't be a symmetry to reverse one and not the other. Okay. So this manipulation relies on me being able to sort of move the clock infinitely far away from the system so that I can define symmetries that act on the two separately. Um, and so there will really be corrections to this calculation uh, if the universe has finite size. And those corrections you won't be able to understand um, without going to this Hilbert space, which is real. So the claim is that the, the reality of the Hilbert space introduces corrections to quantum mechanics, which go away in the limit that the universe becomes large. Okay. Now, I should say that in electrodynamics, there's something perfectly analogous to this that happens, right? Say I'm living in a, in a sphere universe, and I want to measure two to two electron scattering. There's this inconvenient fact that I can't make a state of two electrons because it doesn't have zero charge, okay? And the way you fix that is you put two positrons on the other side of the universe to soak up the flux. And then locally you do two to two electron scattering and you get something that's not quite the S matrix, you know, but it's not too different from it if the universe is big. Um, so here the, the clock is playing the role of the positrons on the other side of the universe um, in that experiment, okay. Um, now, of course, we're never gonna measure any of these corrections, right? Even, you know, because we don't even know, maybe our universe is infinitely big, right? Um, so, so this is not a, a measurable thing. But I think it's a very strong constraint if you want to try to come up with a theory of quantum gravity in a closed universe, you know, like a holographic dual of quantum gravity in a closed universe, because it's saying the Hilbert space has to be real. So somehow the structure of that theory must be such that it forces the Hilbert space to be real. Um, you know, which is to me fairly surprising. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. We've definitely gone on long enough. So thank you everyone for listening. Happy to take more questions. Thank you, Daniel. Question from the audience? Also on my audience. Yeah, please yeah. Sorry. Um, maybe please let me think how can I do this question again? Yeah. So we use patent function to define the two states yes. uh, on matches uh, like variables. Yeah. Um what I was asking that like say assume this role is an anti-linear operator. Then you can also Right, no, but rho is a linear operator. Like, I define it to be so when I define it, it's a, right like this rho is a linear operator, and it's a positive times a unit. Yeah, I mean, in this example, like, yeah, but how about like defining the happiness Well, I, so I think you have to make a choice. So, I mean, you see, <laughs> the formula I got for rho in the CFD was also linear, right? Because there were there were there were two anti unitary operators, right? So it made a unitary operator. Sure. So I, I think you can't stop me from just defining the operator by giving the word its, its components in a basis. I said, so that's... That's just my definition. I yeah. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, I think if we tried to make it anti-linear, we'd probably get really confused. In principle, we could, but I don't know if there would be any nice calculations. Yeah. 
Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So I don't know whether this analogy is right. So you know, sometimes we may start with uh, maybe system with fermions and with Hilbert space. Then the fermions can be complex. The Hilbert space can want to be complex. Yeah. But sometimes we can rewrite a complex fermion as a two real yeah fermions. For example, a lot of modeling details you write one yes. complex fermion zero dimension to. Yeah, but usually we say the Hilbert space is that's, still that's, complex. Okay, right? that's right. So I was wondering, uh, so that's not the analogy you are trying to make, right? You are really trying to make a Hilbert space yes. real. I really want the Hilbert right. space. But then I'm confused by one thing. So in, in the usual topological phase, not like braiding process, you do want to measure something like Berry phase, which is complex, a complex phase. So what does this type of context mean? Like no, but I think yeah. everything you measure in the end is going to be the expectation value of a Hermitian operator. Okay. I think that's just true. That's okay. quantum mechanics. Okay. You 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 know it's yeah the Berry phase maybe it's like the entropy or something. Right? There are lots of things in quantum mechanics that are computable but not measurable directly. Okay. To me, measurable okay. really means like here's the you know I have one copy of the system in the lab and there's some experiment I'm going to do to get a, a result. Uh, you know, and you can't measure the entropy like that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you can probably so try to example, like even the electron like the double slit experiment. Maybe you are say uh, in 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 the quantum mechanical way we are having some complex inter interference. But in the end, we want to make some amplitude. Yeah. In the end, the answer is a probability, a right? Yeah. Yeah. This probability is all you ever actually measure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A very very random problem, like a direct consequence um, at the Hilbert space uh, is real. Yeah, um, is that uh, this kind of system can be efficiently simulated on classes? Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, like like why? Um, I mean, if you use people, uh, I mean, like the universal big set and only, I mean, well, sorry, you <clears throat> because you'll still have a sign problem because. It's real, but you can do superpositions with either side. Uh, so you'll have to compute overlap, you know, to compute evolution and so on in the Hilbert space. So it'll be orthogonal instead of unitary. Yeah. But there will still be science that can go either way. So I mean, yeah. So so you mean like the like the difference between plus and minus like effectively acts as a pH. Like, Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think in order to be it to be Easy classically, you need to make it positive. But, you know, I see. Yeah. Okay, great. I, I have a small technical question. Just yeah. add, like, can you explain again the procedure of just like this adding the background? Uh, yeah, like this green H field, the, the holonomy, the line that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, you mean, so I mean, this example or in general? So, well, maybe yeah, that example. Yeah, so an example the idea is I wrap the symmetry operator. Um, so, th this is a the code dimension, this is a dimension D minus one operator. Mm -hmm. It's code dimension one. Yeah. Right? So then I take the cycle, the one cycle where I want there to be um, a holonomy, and I find a punk rate dual cycle. Uh, and then I put this on the dual cycle. So here it's obvious what the dual cycle is because I do the cylinder. I guess to do a general manifold, then you have to use the theorem that there is a punk rate dual cycle to know that there's some cycle left. Yeah, and then the only trouble is that is that there could be inter in general there will be intersections between the groups, and you have to say something about that, and that's where you could have the help. Makes sense. Sure. Okay. I think we should thank Daniel again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's cool. Do you guys have lunch after this, by the way? Or we have a sem member seminar, so you, we can go up there. You know, just oh, so there's food upstairs. Up there. yeah, yes. Member seminar. Dinner will be separate. Yeah. By the way, if you guys want, you can. Join the dinner. Sorry, okay. Dan, I'm a bit slow about this. Can you explain again the density matrix? Why is it that you do the upper right to lower left? Yeah, well, well, I wanted, you wanted to define, you know, I just wanted to define what? a state. Uh, with an email you know, for example, maybe I'll just put it in. And what you can think about it is there's really a thing I need here. We can meet it. I can compute the Euclidean core. Okay, yeah, yeah, maybe a stretch. Sure, an analytic run. 630 or 70. Okay, I think it would depend on it. So I was trying to say in the first place, like, what that is. 630 or 70. Oh, good. Okay.
will be the restaurant. That's what you usually do with your part of Euclidean. Yeah. Okay. So the Euclidean will be a strip. So let's be nice. Okay. It looks like this. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. But then if I want to give it a a Hilbert space, I should change my head and cut it. Yeah. 